So let's go straight to London and talk to my colleague Juliana Alayenka from our studios uh, about where uh, we are, uh, the twists and turns of the Brexit deal. Give us a summary here, uh, Juliana. I'm sure it's a very long story. We could spend a whole day talking about it. But in summary, where are we at the moment? Who's in? Who's out? Well, in summary, Boson, uh, Brexit is almost on hold at the moment. The EU, of course, granted an extension uh, to the uh, leave date till the 31st of January. And now we're really in the full thrust of Brexit selection, as it's been called. And it's really a decision for the British people uh, between who they want to take them out of the EU. On the one hand, on the right side, you've got uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, who's uh, voting, kind of running on a mandate of uh, get Brexit done over the weekend. He had a series of groveling interviews where he did have to apologise um, to his uh, fan base and to conservatives that uh, put him in the chair because, of course, his whole mandate was getting us out on October the 31st, which he uh, tried and failed to deliver. And on the far left side, you've got Jeremy Corbyn. He's been the leader of the opposition for four and a half years. And his campaign is trying to offer uh, the British public a second referendum. A couple of days ago, Boris Johnson did write an open letter to uh, the Labour leader, basically saying, what exactly is it your Brexit uh, plan will seek to do? Because, of course, they've tried to thwart the Brexit process all year and uh, Boris Johnson accused him of uh, trying to uh, not ease the pain of businesses and families. So we know that Boris Johnson will go ahead with his uh, Brexit deal if he does win a majority and if the Labour's, the Labour Party win a majority then they will renegotiate a deal with the EU and bring it back to the British public. So if Labour do win there will be a second referendum in about six months. The Brexit election, whatever terminologies we're coming up with. So, the last general election... Brexit election. Uh, Brexit election. That sounds more like a musical group. Maybe at the end of the day, we're going to have some music made out of this and song, mm. kind of looking more like a, a musical show. But again, it's a very serious business because you taxpayers, UK taxpayers, will have to cough out the cost of this election. So, how much would it likely cost? Who's likely spending what money? Because... As soon as you close the parliament Wednesday, the vicious campaign will get started. Well, of course, the uh, campaign has similarly started for over the past couple of days. But yes, you're right. Tomorrow, once Parliament is dissolved, the campaign will really kick off. And, you know, with um, elections, even elections that take place in Nigeria, there's always a little bit of conspiracy about who is spending what. What we do know is that uh, in the 2017 election, the taxpayer had to fork out about £140 million. Pounds. There are 650 constituencies, uh, 650 MPs, um, around the country and every constituency has a budget of about £30,000. That's for the party. But each individual MP within that constituency has a new cap and that cap is £15,000. So that's about £45,000 that they can spend on social media, um, banners, leaflets, etc, etc. Uh, there has been some new rules that have been put into play because the Conservative Party and some other parties during the referendum campaign Campaign were caught to be spending a lot more money uh, than some others. And this was in putting some people up in lavish um, hotels, being able to really knock on each and every single door. And it was, it was deemed to be unfair. But there are some other unfair means, and some of them include uh, donations. And we know that the Conservative Party, uh, you know, Trump, uh, their other party uh, uh, candidates, because they receive the most money. And you would expect that because, of course, the Conservatives are more leaning towards uh, businesses. So we're probably likely to see about over 100 million, uh, which is still a lot of money, considering it's a very short campaign of just five weeks. Hmm. Um, Juliana, the, the last one, very quickly. Uh, the, a new report by Financial Times says the London Underground uh, is, uh, the part, is the dirtiest part of the city. Uh, what is this report all about? How much do we know? Do we have any stats here? 
Well, it's an interesting story, actually, considering that uh, the London Underground has actually been going for 156 years, believe it or not. That's a very, very long time, 156 years of having underground transport. And 4.8 million people, including myself, uh, use the transport system every day. And the FT, considering we are in... A, a OK, I guess we lost uh, Juliana Olayin Kade, my colleague from... Uh studios in london thank you so much juliana that's a technical glitch uh, it happens uh, uh, everywhere thank you we, we apologize to our viewers uh, for that that's talking about the london underground a new report by financial times of london says the london underground is dirty such that tons and millions of tons of dust are scraped from them now has to be looked into as you heard one of the oldest underground uh, transport uh, system in the world a hundred plus year old. Okay, let's uh, check in with Temple Ashaji very quickly. Another colleague of mine. I've got colleagues everywhere, don't I? Uh, he's from the Nigerian Stock Exchange. He's standing there uh, for us. Temple, where are we at the moment uh, as we tee off today's trading day? Give us a minute or two. We're in a green position, Bosin. We're up some 0.13 percent. We've got interest again in the banking stocks. Uh, we've seen the likes of Spambi Kai BTC, uh, Zenith Bank, uh, Guarantee Trust Bank, all of these key companies experiencing uh, some positive shifts at this point in the markets. They are the um, numbers or they are the stocks actually currently dominating uh, the top traded. Uh, portion of the market right now. If you check on the portal of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, those are the companies that you got uh, currently making waves in the markets. These are basically the areas where we've seen bargain hunting uh, as it opened yesterday. Uh, we are seeing that level of optimism also being sustained in the market at this point in time. All of these companies, Tambic, Grant Trust Bank, Zenith Bank, uh, Access Bank, are currently experiencing less than 1% uh, increase in their share price, uh, but perhaps the way the market opened yesterday and uh, it moved on till the end of the session, that's pr probably the pattern that we will see again today, where it opened uh, with with mild gains and it increased all the way till the close of the to the close of the session, Bosin. At uh, Temple, the story we want to uh, chase around is the Dangote Industries. Now it looks like I mean the group. Uh, the Dangote flower story is there, a board change, uh, the cash for the purchase mm. uh, by Crown Flamies and all of that. Then you have the Dangote sugar refinery going to bed with yes. Savannah. It looks like this is one company, a lot is happening around there. The big man, the Trilonia, is actually rejigging its portfolio. That's what it means. We all know that uh, he, the Magnet is actually investing heavily in uh, the Dangote refinery. That seems to be his focus. It looks like he's pulling from, from this point, from this point uh, to the other point. Uh, there was a report that came out uh, a few weeks ago, and it says that uh, the volume of uh, cargo that has been recorded in the Nigerian ports this year alone has more like never been uh, at, that, at that level before. And it is basically because of Dangota refinery. It looks like this whole rejigging, this whole portfolio rebalancing by this magnet is what is actually responsible for all of these uh, developments, deals here and there. You're selling down on these to get some capital and move to these, and then you're trying to merge with others to increase your attention. Looks like that is what is responsible for all of these uh, shifts that we're seeing in the market. The man sure knows his onions, and we do believe that uh, all of these will lead to a positive end for him eventually. Okay, thank you. Stand by. Uh, you have the rest of the day. We've got to do a crossover at 1.30 on Business Incorporated. Thank you so much, uh, Temple Ashaju. Uh, let's bring in the debt market here and check in our opening calls for today. You saw the market yesterday via the FMDQ Securities Exchange. A very lackluster Monday, as it were, on the Treasury side. Let me ask Ramat Baba, who is the chief dealer for fixed income at FBN Quest Merchant Bank, uh, to talk to us for about a minute or two on what we're seeing at the moment in terms of where the yield curve is going, the liquidity, and what our investors are positioning for the latest central bank directive on treasuries, open market operations invested. Ramat, good morning. Good morning, Bosu. Ramat, uh, I, I, what, 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 uh, interpret these numbers for us. Where the yield curve is going, 9.95% 9 
for tertiaries maturing due next year? Um, yes, for uh, um, NT bills, um, yields have continued to trend south, and that's majorly because of the CBN's um, circular, which restricts local investors from investing in these UMU bills. Of course, since they cannot invest in UMU bills, every, all attention is shifting to um, the primary bills, that's the bills issued at the primary auction. As a result, we've seen a lot of demand coming in for the primary bills and yields trending significantly lower. For the UMU bills, yields still remain high, but of course, this is not within the reach of the local investors anymore. Ramat Baba and our viewers, sorry, we got to wrap it up there for today. Ramat Baba uh, from FBN Quest Merchant Bank talking about the opening call for today's uh, fixed income marketplace. That's about all for today on Business Morning. Uh, join us tomorrow Wednesday for another edition of the show. I'll see you then.